Today we're going to talk about the nervous system and it is thoroughly in depth. So here goes. Why do animals need a nervous system? So why does it even exist? Well, we need a way to pick up and process the information that comes from the outside world. Alright, so that's why. So what kind of characteristics do animals need in a nervous system? It needs to be fast, right? Because if I touch the stove and a minute later my brain tells me it's hot, then I'll have already burnt myself. It needs to be accurate. It needs to send good signals, clear signals, and it needs to be able to reset quickly. So it sends a signal, needs to be able to reset right away so that it's ready to send another signal. All right, some fun facts about the nervous system. Uh, the simplest nervous system is in a hydra, and a uh, hydra has simply a nerve net, which is just a network of nerve cells, and then the impulse travels both ways. Um, slightly more complex, they start developing, um, organisms start developing ganglia, which are clumps of nerve cells, and they're kind of like a primitive brain. Most complex, what we have, is a brain that has specialized cells called neurons. They are the functional unit of the nervous system. All right, so here we've got our overview of the nervous system. First, we're going to talk specifically about neurons, and then we're going to go back into this diagram. But I just want to touch on it briefly. The nervous system has the central nervous system, which is made up of the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is everything else. So, nervous system cells are neurons. They're nerve cells and they're the functional unit of the nervous system. Neurons are what make the, the nervous system. So the signal direction comes in here into these dendrites. These branch looking things are called dendrites. Then right here is the cell body. That's the central uh, part. It's got everything that's normal in a cell, all the normal organelles. And then it comes out into an axon this is actually a myelinated axon. We'll talk about what that is later. Um, and the signal goes this way to the synapse, and then we'll talk about where it goes. So dendrite to cell body to the axon. And the structure fits the function. There are a lot of entry points, all these little dendrites, and one path out. So it transmits the signal to a neuron or to an organ. So the types of neurons, they can be classified as sensory neurons which are the ones that take in the information um, and feel uh, whatever it is. Then here's our cell body, our axon. Then we get an interneuron, a between neuron. Um, so they connect the sensory neurons with the motor neurons. And the motor neuron is the one that tells our body what to do. So here we go, our sensory neurons take in information from our sensory environment, like the stove is hot. And then the motor neurons, also known as effector neurons, take those central nervous system commands and turn them into motor outputs. For example, pull your hand back from the stove. And then interneurons are the ones in the middle. They make those connections with the other neurons and they are in the central nervous system, the brain or spinal cord. So how is a signal transmitted? Basically think dominoes. We start the signal. You know, you tap the first domino, um, that triggers the signal. Then you propagate the signal. Okay, think of it this way. When you hit the first domino, do the other dominoes actually move down the line? No, they stay where they're at, but they fall over, hit another one, and they send the energy in a wave through the whole line of dominoes. Then uh, you have to reset the system. Before you can knock down the dominoes again, you have to set them all up over again. So that's resetting the axon. We'll talk about what that looks like. So the neuron is fairly similar. It's got something called protein channels, and they're set up, ready to go. Once the first one's open, the rest open in succession. You open one, all the rest start to open. It's an all or nothing response. So that's kind of the wave action that travels along the neuron, passing along that message. Then, before it can go again, you have to reset the channels so the neuron can react. So, cells live in a sea of charged ions. See these sodium ions and potassium ions? Then inside we've got potassium positive ions and chlorine negative ions and some other negative ions inside. And so there's some potassium outside, 
um, but also some inside. The channel also leaks potassium, we'll talk about that in a second. So anions are our negatively charged ions, and they are more concentrated within the cell, in the axon, so we're looking at the axon right now, the tail of our neuron. So for example, chlorine ion, Cl, um, or charged amino acids, AA. Cations are the positive ones, and they're more concentrated in the extracellular fluid, the fluid outside of the cell. So, uh, we spoke earlier of those protein channels. Well, we've got these ion channels. There's sodium, potassium, and ATPase, and through those channels, they push two potassium ions into the cell, into the axon, for every three sodium ions out of the cell. So you're losing one positive charge every time they make that swap, so you end up with this net negative charge in the cell. There are also leaky protein channels, where potassium, um, those channels are kind of leaky and they slowly lose potassium from inside the cell, making it even more negative. So those lead to that negative charge inside the cell and polarize the neuronal membrane. So cells have voltage, opposite charges on opposite sides of the cell membrane. The membrane's polarized, so it's negative inside and positive outside. That's polarized, two different ends of the spectrum. Um, it makes it for a charge gradient. So a gradient is it's different over a certain area. So here it's positive on one side, negative on the other. And it's basically like stored energy. It's kind of a battery. It's, this energy is waiting to be used. So how do we measure cell voltage? You'd kind of see a voltmeter, stick it inside the cell, stick it outside the cell. The difference in the two is negative 70 millivolts. Okay, so negative 70, keep that in mind, it's that negative. And that's inside this axon. So this unstimulated neuron has a resting potential, is what we call it, when nothing's happening. It's, it's at negative 70 millivolts. Alright, so how does a nerve impulse travel? First, there's a sim stimulus, right? Something stimulates it, stimulates the nerve. Then it reaches the threshold potential, the potential at which um, a nerve cell says, okay, I guess it's, this is important enough to tell a message. So that triggers the action potential, which is when we open sodium channels, sodium ion channels in the cell membrane. Those sodium ions diffuse into the cell. Then charges reverse at that point on the neuron. So right here we've flipped it. So we have positive on the inside, negative on the outside because we've taken its positive charge. So it becomes what we call depolarized. So positive on the inside, negative on the outside. Depolarized. This is like our first domino going down. Then uh, it makes that wave of dominoes. The rest of them fall, right? So it's a nerve impulse that travels down the neuron. The change in the charge in one gate uh, opens the next gate down the line. They are what we call voltage-gated channels. When the voltage changes, the channels open or close. So the sodium ions continue to diffuse into the cell, so they keep coming in, and this wave moves down the neuron. That's our action potential. Then how do we reset? A second wave travels down the neuron. These potassium channels open up and they slowly release uh, potassium. So these potassium ions diffuse out of the cell. And again, this doesn't catch up to this or totally cancel it out because this opens slower than the sodium channels. And the sodium channels open faster and close slower than the potassium channels. So these positive ions diffuse out of the cell and that is what we call repolarization. So that's when we uh, reverse the charges back at that point. So depolarization is when we make it positive on the inside, negative on the outside. And repolarization is putting it back to negative on the inside, positive on the outside. So then those combined waves, both of those, travel down the neuron. And the wave of opening ion channels moves on down the signal goes in one direction. It does not go back. It doesn't have second thoughts and turn around and walk the other way. Um, and the flow of potassium out of the cell stops the activation of the sodium channels in the wrong direction. 
So this keeps the sodium channels from continuing to let sodium into the cell. Alright, so that action potential, that wave, propagates. It keeps going. Um, it's also our nerve impulse. So we get from brain to fingertips in milliseconds. So it's a really efficient system. All right, so again, we've got these ion channels that open and close in response to cha changes in charge. Our sodium channels open quickly in response to depolarization, and they close slowly, whereas our potassium channels open slowly and close slowly, comparatively. It's not like a really slow process. It's just slower than the sodium channels opening. All right, so how does the nerve reset itself? Well, there's something called the refractory period. After we fire a neuron, it's got to reset itself. So sodium needs to move out. There's too much sodium in. And potassium needs to come back in because we've just pumped it out. Both are moving against concentration gradients. So the sodium in here is moving into an area where there is more sodium. And so the sodium's like, hey, I don't really want more sodium here. And this potassium here is moving into an area where there's more potassium. This potassium's like, hey, we're good with it just being us. We don't need more of us. So the, in order to go against the flow, they need a pump. So we have the sodium-potassium pump. It uses the active transport protein in the membrane. So it requires ATP, a form of energy in our body. Remember again, three sodium out for every two potassium in. So it eventually resets the charge across the membrane because it's losing one positive charge each time. Here you can see the diffusion of the potassium out and the sodium in through those ion channels. And then here's our pump to pump sodium out and to pump potassium in. And it uses ATP in order to do it. It needs energy. And after that, the neuron's ready to fire again. Negative on the inside positive on the outside. All right, here's our action potential graph. We have our resting potential. That's right here. It's just sitting there, happy, nothing's happening. Then the stimulus reaches the threshold potential. It gets stimulated, and it's like, all right, well, this is serious. Let's do something about it. Then depolarization, that's as the sodium flows in. Sodium flows in, depolarization. Then repolarization, we reset the charge gradient. That potassium flows out. That's us, our leaky protein channels, but this is actually trying to get rid of potassium. Then we've got here this hyperpolarization or undershoot. So it just swings a little wide of where it's supposed to be and then returns back to resting. Some central nervous system and most peripheral nervous system neurons um, have this myelin sheath. They're like the cable internet of the nervous system. So what you do is you insulate sections of the axon and then the gaps right in between see how it's not perfectly smooth? These gaps are called the nodes of Ranvier. So this speeds, this speeds up the signal because the signal goes from node to node. Um, what we call saltatory conduction. And it goes at about 150 meters per second, really fast. So here's our myelin sheath, the uh, underlying core of it all. So at the end of the axon, what happens? Well, the impulse has to jump the synapse. There's a junction between the neurons, and it has to jump quickly from one cell to the next. So how does it jump? Well, you reach the end of the road. There's an axon bulb, also called a synaptic knob, this kind of round part at the end of the axon, releases a neurotransmitter, which is a chemical, into the space between the neurons, which we call the synapse or the synaptic cleft. And then it, this neurotransmitter diffuses and binds to these receptors on the, on the dendrite of the next neuron. And that triggers action potential in this neuron. 